Welcome back to Recalibratency. I'm honored today to be joined by Ryan Fuget. He is the founder of Shop Mode Digital. And today we're going to be talking about how to get new clientele when your luck just seems to have run out. So Ryan, welcome. And would you tell us a little bit about yourself? Thanks for having me. Sure. I uh, did not start out in any web capacity at all. Uh, I went to college in the 90s before it was really a, a thing. So I have a painting degree uh, and got thrown into web dev kind of by accident. Uh, pretty much learned everything I know uh, from what I say is the University of Barnes & Noble. Uh, so I just go to Barnes & Noble and read every web design and development book that came out. Couldn't afford to buy them. So I would just take pictures of the pages uh, and go home and, uh, and, and read the books then. So I've been doing this uh, since 2003, roughly, this sort of thing, uh, custom web development primarily, and most recently uh, Shopify development with, through Shop Mode. So yeah, I've got an art degree and kind of uh, have fallen into development over the years, uh, design and development, then more into development, and now owning an agency into, into management and, and uh, just overseeing things more or less. So as you kind of fell into this interesting world of web design and marketing and agency life. What's been the biggest challenge that you've had? Well, one problem is you go into business to do a particular thing because you're good at a thing. Like I was quite good at, you know, designing layouts and style sheets and doing, you know, CSS and that sort of thing. And the more I got into actually running the agency, the less of that I was doing. So I realized you just start wearing all these hats, right? You know, uh, sales, marketing, doing some of the coding still, that sort of thing. And the, uh, the biggest challenge is for me, because I'm introverted, doing the sales and marketing, like it's really a, a large effort to maintain that or do any of it at all. So I need to try to figure out every trick in the book, short of hiring someone for those places. If if I'm wearing that hat, I need, you know, efficient ways to do that sort of thing. What kinds of tactics have you come across as you've been just battling this, this concept of I'm an introvert, I'm stressed out at events, I have a hard time just reaching out to people because you're not alone in that. What have you learned over the years to help you cope with some of those differences in who you need to be and who you are? I think part of it, getting anything done is consistency. And that applies to marketing too. You don't have to, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. You're not going to get 5,000 new clients in a month. And who would want that, frankly, anyway, you know, just doing a little bit every day. And I think it's Jerry Seinfeld, the famous story about breaking the chain. You know, how do you, how do you get so many jokes written? How do you do your work? How do you get so much accomplished? Oh, I just, you know, write a joke every day and make an X on the calendar and just don't break the chain. And I, I apply that to everything and I really need to apply that better to marketing because it does work, you know, every day, just doing a little something, commenting on LinkedIn, sending a warm email, you know, uh, writing a content piece, even, you know, that isn't aimed at anyone in particular, but you know, when you're wearing a lot of hats, it's hard to carve out the time to do that and all the other things that need to be done. There's a lot of advice that circulates of, oh, you just need to block out time on your calendar, or mm -hmm. you need to make sure that you've got this whole plan lined out and then give tasks to yourself and to other people. What's your approach so that you are consistently getting marketing and sales done for your agency? Well, I went down the road of buying like courses and systems, uh, you know, for cold emails, you know, these LinkedIn systems, that sort of thing. But someone on LinkedIn said that, you know, courses and things like that are actually just a form of procrastination. And it's true. A lot of times people buy these, myself included, and you don't actually complete the whole thing. You don't leverage it as much as it could be leveraged. So to me, it's like you got to avoid any kind of like, this is, this is, you know, like a magic pill type thing and just set the bar low. Like, like we have quarterly goals, right, in our business here. And you know, I had set a goal of a hundred cold emails and I was like, I can do that over the next few months. And like, I didn't hit that goal. It's like, it was just too big a goal for me. It was too aspirational. So it's like, well, what can I do? How about five warm emails? And like, that should be easy enough to do. And it should be easy enough to surpass. And that way I feel like I'm actually doing something. Yeah. I might be doing one twentieth of, of what I 
thought I could have done, but you know, I'm actually getting it done rather than setting nothing. If you went to the gym tomorrow to lift 300 pounds when you can only lift 100 pounds today, that's an unrealistic expectation of yourself. And mm -hmm. a lot of times we do place these really high expectations on ourselves and then we're disappointed because we're not achieving the standard that we hope to achieve. But we've got to be gracious to where we're at now, being mindful of where we want to be, but knowing like, okay, there's a process here. There's steps that we have to take in order to get there. So I really like your approach of noticing, okay, this goal was too high. What can I actually do? Mm -hmm setting a new goal and continuing to strive for that new goal that you actually can achieve. Right. And, you know, you can't beat yourself up. You do have to uh, give yourself some, some grace and some space. You're going to mess up. You're going to, you know, misalign yourself with what you think you can do to what you can do. And it's okay to change your mind or, or change your goals. I mean, you know, it's like going, you know, if you go too far down a wrong path, it's at a certain point, there's that sunk cost uh, fallacy, right? Where it's like, oh, if I just keep going, it's gonna, it's gonna work out. But, you know, but sometimes you just got to back up and, and take a new path. Have you ever had any path shifts and, you know, lane departures per se, where you're like, okay, I realize this might not be the best way to keep going. I'm going to pivot a little bit and try this direction. Have you experienced that? Yeah, we, a uh, number of years ago, we built a SaaS product. And I was like, oh, this is, this is going to be it. You know, we're working on one project. All we need to do, all we need to do is get multiple people to sign up for this one thing. And, and we're in the money. It's going to be fantastic and everything. And it was an absolute dog because it was just more marketing we had to do on top of the marketing and sales I had to do for the main business. And it worked for a while, but I realized I was like, I can't continue to maintain this and we, our heart's not in it and people were using it and, and that was fine, but you know, we just had to, we had to nix it and, and move on. That's a hard thing to do to nix something that you worked on and that you built. Did you fully can it or are you still maintaining it in a small capacity? Yeah, we, we ended up fully canning the thing. You know, I spoke about it at web conferences and uh, had a bit part on like a NPR thing about it. And, and, and I was like, oh, this is really going to be something. And then, you know, four years later, it was like, I can't, I can't. So we just canned the whole thing, all the work that went into it, all the planning, you know, all the whiteboards and sticky notes and not, you know, it just all came to nothing. But, and then we ended up doing another take on it a few years later and thinking, you know, we, we learned from our mistakes, we're going to do it again, but we just canned that one after about a year. Like we realized it's just not, not the route for us, you know, but it took yeah. two, two mistakes to do it, to draw it to an end. Yeah. Well, and there's a lot of emotion tied to those things that you're building and creating too. Was it hard to let it go? The first one was because you feel a little bit like you lose your confidence, you know, it's like, oh, I, I just failed at something and I'm, you know, failure's okay. I mean, that's how you grow. You know, the bit, you know, you don't want to be a complete failure. But the second one, it was just like, look, I, I know this isn't working. I'm not going to keep going. You know, I'm not going to take the machete and keep going down this path. We're just going to stop right now. Like, so that one was more of an experienced, we need to stop. But the first one was like, gosh, I really, you know, I was, I was laboring over the decision. I'm sure. I'm sure there were lots of sleepless nights too, because no one wants to be a failure or even think about being perceived as a failure, right? But it's important to remember, like, you can fail at one particular thing and not be a failure. Yeah. And, one and that goes for success, too. Like, if you're having, if you've got a great company or whatever, like, to me, I am not my company at all, even though the name's on the door of my longer term custom web dev company, like that, I don't identify myself as, as that, you know, I got a rich life outside of that, that. Yeah. Has other stuff yeah. going on. Yeah. You are Ryan. Ryan, the whole person. And so tell us a little bit more about this transition and launching kind of this, this second brand with Shotho Digital. I know that's something that is recent and you wanted to mm -hmm. kind of detach from your name so that you could grow something a little bit more uh, 
standalone, I suppose, is the word. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. So uh, 2022 is basically, as it stands, the worst year in oh, I've had in business in like a decade and a half. So, and I saw it coming kind of, and I was like, I can't, you know, you can't turn on a dime. You can't steer the Titanic in a new direction on a dime. So I, I realized we were an undifferentiated company. We weren't positioned. So I, I took a positioning boot camp uh, to kind of figure out what I felt like we could do going forward and how we can really niche down on something and came upon, you know, I, I got interested in, in interesting products in e-commerce. So I said, Hey, maybe, maybe we're going to niche down and, and help people, uh, artistic types do e-commerce and you know the the boot camp basically uh, confirmed like hey it sounds like a great idea and there were a few options on how you might do that you might just like drop what you're doing and switch gears or add it as another uh, service offering for your existing company at the time i was so burned out on my existing company 16 years with my name on the door and clients still wanting to talk to me i haven't been able to like properly like step back so that the rest of the team is the company as well. And I, I think in part because of the name, I didn't want any baggage to come along with the new thing. So we went the, with the third option from the boot camp, which was just start a new brand on the side. And I was like, you know what? This is a chance to start from zero. Uh, we can make it anything we want. I don't have to use the color blue anymore. Like I can just go crazy and, and we can name it whatever we want. Uh, yeah. And it, it can be anything, you know? And so that's, that's where shop mode came in. I thought it kind of hinted at Shopify, which is what we were going to niche down on as far as a tool. And it gave me a chance to use yellow, which uh, I hadn't done in my existing business. So Yeah. And I'm a big fan of yellow. So 10 out of 10 in my book. So, <laughs> so, uh, so did, we spent months studying what we thought we needed to do. You know, I hadn't started a new business in over a decade. So I'm like, how do I, how do I start a new business? You know, Oh, I got it. I need a domain name. I need, you know, all the little things, you know, here's my positioning statement and now what, you know? So in that sense, it's, it's been a little bit like a rebirth and it's been a lot of fun. It is difficult in that now I have two businesses and some side hustles, but the marketing efforts that I'm putting in are going towards the newer shop mode business. Yeah. Have you taken your, you know, 16 years experience and struggles with marketing and business development and kind of paved a specific strategy for this new brand based off of all of that? Or are you doing a lot of the same things for both? Well, I think th there's a couple things here. The, the original business was niched down on a tool that basically no one's ever heard of. So that in itself was a problem, a very small pond of potential customers, right? So anytime I even mention that on LinkedIn, there's very little interaction or no one knows what I'm talking about. But what I found is in a few months of posting a few things from shop mode on LinkedIn is that it gets much more engagement, many more people just looking at this stuff without me doing anything extra, really, just by the fact that the size of the potential audience is just vastly larger than what we were used to talking to before. And it's just been much easier just to mention things and see reactions, right? And then I hired an SEO company. You know, I know a lot of technical SEO. We're, we're quite good at that stuff. But like, I know what I don't know too. So I was like, I'm going to hire someone to help me out on this one. And they were licking their chops at the idea of a brand new, never before, you know, domain ranking of zero. Let's get this off the ground shop mode, you know, Shopify company. So they've given me a lot of content ideas for content because I've never really done consistent content. And so that's one thing we're definitely trying now with shop mode that we weren't doing before is making sure we're doing the thought leadership thing, trying to write articles that aren't just, you know, uh, search engine magnet type stuff, but like have some kind of perspective, you know, that might be a little more memorable. And I looked around to see what people were writing about in Shopify. And there's just a lot of regurgitated listicle fact things with no opinion, no, nothing interesting about them at all. So I'm like, you know, th there's, there's room here for someone to be a little more interesting, I guess. To other agencies who are positioning themselves on top of a tool around marketing and sales, like what advice would you give them? 
I would say do not focus entirely on the tool if at all possible, because I think we've got, we've done that twice over the past 16 years. There was one tool we used for about 12 years and it's great to be an expert in something, but you know, we were getting clients from all walks, you know, television networks, universities, like florists, like it was all over the place. So we didn't really, you know, it's, it's like be one thing if we did it for like dog food companies or something like where we know dog food, you know, and it's like, we've done 20 sites for dog food. No one can beat us at dog food. So we are never able to niche down on a vertical like that. We were always horizontally positioned on a tool and that makes it really hard, especially if you're using a tool that no one's heard of because everyone in that, in that realm was like, what about WordPress? So we're always dealing with that. But now in the Shopify world, people have heard of that. So, you know, they might say, what about big commerce or something, but it's more apples to apples instead of like, what is this weird fruit you just brought me that I don't understand why we would use this, you know? So yeah, you got to avoid being a hundred percent about the tool. Right. Well, then, cause tools change, uh, trends change, but if you build up expertise for an audience, you can relaunch different offerings. You can build on top of different tools you're more adaptable in your actual business model when you're focused on building an audience instead of building on a tool. Because you're saying that your relationship with your clients is based on this tool. And if this tool went away, are you still useful to them? You probably are, but you haven't marketed yourself that way. You've marketed yourself because you're an expert in the tool, not because you're actually helping them save time or, you know, save money or, or whatever it is that, that you're actually doing for them. And sometimes you don't know what that is until you interview them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, to hear uh-huh. it in their own words. Yeah. And there is a wealth of information that you can gather by interviewing your customers and just asking them questions and, and observing what they have to say about their own situation. Mm-hmm. And you can find other things that you may be able to do for them that you hadn't even thought of pitching to them, you know, oh, I didn't realize, you know, they've been a client for five years, but didn't realize that they didn't know we could do X and I didn't realize they needed X, you know? So it it is nice to be able to talk to them outside of a a project situation every once in a while, just on a, hey, you know, let's reevaluate our relationship. How are we doing, you know? And do you ever send out customer satisfaction scores and surveys and net promoter scores, anything like that? We had done that a number of years ago, not in a formal way. I read a book a few years ago called The Revenue Growth Habit, which talked about getting testimonials and plastering them everywhere. So at that point, I went through a bunch of the steps they were talking about and was interviewing clients, especially after a project launched or something like that, you know, figuring out what we did right, what we did wrong. And those helped to helped me to realize that the way we talk about what we do for people isn't the same. It's not the same language as how they talk. You know, we talk about it in technical terms, Right. you know, they talk about it in like, I don't know, human terms or, or, you know, non-technical ways like, oh, you don't code for me. You do whatever, you know, however they might phrase it. And it's like, wow, it's just kind of eye-opening. Talk to them in that way. Yeah, absolutely. You've got you know, this is pretty common where you maybe have like an inbound marketing firm and they do all of these things related to content, like content strategy and blogs and social media and email marketing. And the client's like, oh yeah, they're my social media people. Like it's t- just a totally different perception. Mm-hmm. <laughs> With that kind of taking time to understand your customer's perspective about what you do. Have you learned anything along the way about how to best handle those interactions and actually make space in your calendar for those conversations? I do. We have a very small uh, stable of clients, like really long-term ones that I've learned are not necessarily the best thing. You have clients that are, you know, seven years in, eight years in, 10 years in. There's a point at which there's a power shift and you have the most power in the relationship. This is Blair Enns talking through, through me here now. At the beginning of the relationship, when you're seen as the expert, right? And you're, you know, you're the solution to their problem. But as that time goes by, you're losing the power in the relationship. And eventually you can be seen as a commodity or, or you know, just completely taken for granted. So 
Absolutely. You know, we've got a lot of longer term client relationships. I haven't had great success in getting a ton of people to come to our front door, if you will. So in some, in some ways, you kind of have to take what you get when so few people are coming to the door. And that's been my real struggle is that marketing and sales and, and just reaching out in a cold or warm way to find new people. Because in the first few years, we were just spoiled rotten with either referrals or we would work with agencies who were multipliers for us. So we, they would give us, you know, build after build. And I only have to interface with one set of people. And we had started a, an online store in 2009 for the system that we were working with. And that completely subsidized our business for, you know, 10 years or something like that. So I actually got spoiled by having this online store. There were, there were entire years where we didn't have to do any client work if we didn't want to, you know, so that gave us freedom to do other things. You know, we had that, that, that kind of guaranteed uh, revenue stream, you know, and when that started going away, it was like, oh, maybe we should get some client work in. By then I, you know, hadn't had years of experience that I probably should have had uh, in, in doing that. So I'm like, well, how do I do this? You know, I'd, I'd relied a lot on luck early on. Luck in the sense of uh, mouth referrals and, and partnership referrals. Is that what you mean by luck? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I went out on my own doing web development in 2006 and it took you know, two years only to get my first enterprise client. But, you know, I just reached out to me. I was like, do you have the right number? Like, are you, why are you calling me? And I couldn't believe this. And, it, you know, it was from there, I did two or three, I think three builds, you know, for large brands and that sort of thing. And it was like, I didn't do anything to get that, that work. So I thought it was, you know, I was kind of brought up, I guess, to think it's that easy. It's like, oh, I'll just sit back and wait for someone to, contact me, but it's not that easy and it's different when you're by yourself, you know, it's that much harder when, um, when you've got payroll to worry about. Yeah, absolutely. And even the whole environment now, the landscape for agencies to get more clients is a lot more competitive and commoditized because thinking back to, you know, 2006 versus 2022, there are all of these different platforms that are connecting brands to freelancers and brands to really cheap commoditized marketing labor and the number of agencies that exist in general has also exploded. So you have all of these factors that make it a lot harder to get new clients. I agree. I think it's completely different. And I think we've fallen into a valley between commoditized development I don't want to put this like I had, I found that in the last year or so, people haven't been wanting to pay that larger hourly rate for custom web development when we're between things like newer no code tools, like, you know, Webflow, and then, you know, you've got your offshore, you know, development shops that are far cheaper than, than, you know, us coding shops. And that sort of thing. So it's like they can go in either of these directions. And we've lost some some custom web clients to web projects. You know, I baffled like, can you, can you really rebuild what you had on, on a tool like that? Maybe you can. I don't know. Good luck, I guess. But um, you know, we're in this valley. So that that's where the idea was like, you know, I think e-commerce, which we traditionally avoided forever, might be a good thing to get into. Just even from a recurring revenue standpoint. It, you know, I, I'm really big on technical SEO and, and really getting speeds, page speeds dialed in and that sort of thing. Not as important to clients who have brochure sites as it is to people that have e-commerce sites where the ROI is far more measurable. Absolutely. Yeah, you have to find that space where the focus that you have, the attention to detail that you have is most impactful to that specific customer type. And avoiding price differentiation, I think is also really important. You want to make sure that you're adding value in different ways. You don't want to just be the lowest cost option because there's always going to be someone who's cheaper than you are. Absolutely. And, you know, I used to, back in my confident days when I felt that, you know, was, everything was luck, I used to just tell people straight out, like, we're not the cheapest option on the block. And that was true back in the day. 
But, you know, over the years, I've just kind of, you know, I don't know if I'm less risky now. I've got kids and I'm older and it's like, I don't feel confident enough to say that sort of thing or to change my prices to even reflect that. You know, when, when you're not getting the projects that you think you should be getting, you start to lose confidence. And, you know, two or three quarters goes by when, you, you know, no one's knocking on the door. Your existing clients, you know, are not buying anything. There's no new projects. And it's like, you know, what, what do I have to do? I, you know, is it me? You know, you start, you start really wondering what you're doing. I, I think one of the things too, as far as content marketing, because we don't have a lot of case studies or actual work, I've just been going and finding stores for whom I wish I would have built the site or would like to do work. And I just do a teardown of the store, write down anything I can find about the, what apps are you using? How are they doing this? That helps me learn even more. And then I can go ping someone at the company and say, hey, I did a break down your, you know, break down your store. Uh, you know, you might be interested. You know, perfect, perfect introduction. You know, hey, I took the time to see what you got going on. You know, no, no sales pitch or anything. And that's worked for us in the past. I've written warm emails to people. You know, hey, I found an error on your site. You know, I noticed you use this system that we're good. And we've gotten years worth of work out of some of those, you know, seemingly, you know, just helpful, no, no sales pitch type emails before. So you know, yeah. I, out. I love those yeah. approaches. Yeah. Finding ways to be helpful without coming across as, well, you have to hire us. Yeah. Just finding that, that nice balance. Are there any final thoughts that you'd like to share with other agency owners who are struggling with their positioning and struggling with getting clients and having a steady, steady sales pipeline? Any other advice? The only thing I can say, and this is what I tell myself all the time too, is just never take your foot off the marketing gas, even when you're busy, because by the time you realize you need more work, it's almost too late, like every time. So you, you just need to keep doing something. And there are going to be times when you have more time to do more stuff, but those times when you're busy, just send out messages on LinkedIn or do something simple, but just keep, keep top of mind with people. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Consistency is the best recipe to success, for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you again to Ryan for coming on Recalibrate and See and sharing his experience over the years of dealing with finding new clientele and marketing your agency and positioning and navigating pivots. It's all very important to keep top of mind as small agencies, large agencies, everything in between. I want to call out just a couple of things to keep in mind as you move forward today. First, sell yourself, not the tools that you build on. It's really easy to try to position yourself as a solutions provider for a specific platform, but you need to be careful because platforms change, tools change, people's preferences change. I mean, think about just project management tools. For example, Asana used to be really big and then all the rage was teamwork. And then now it's all shifting to ClickUp and there'll be something new, you know, a year from now as well. And that's what's going to happen with the different tools that you're building on for clients as well. So you want to focus on building up an audience that you're an expert for so that you can adapt your offerings to serve your customers as businesses, as people, so that you can continue to change as the times a call for it. The second thing is to make sure that you're identifying marketing expenses versus marketing investments and making sure that you're actually taking steps to move your marketing forward instead of procrastinating. Ryan brought up a great point that regularly, it's easier just to buy a course to feel like you're doing something to move your business forward. But in reality, you're just procrastinating. And so instead, try to find the time to move forward, overcome that imposter syndrome, overcome the battles that are raging inside you about what you should and shouldn't do, and just do something. Done is better than perfect. And you'll have more outcomes once you start moving forward than if you stay where you are right now. And that's all for today on Recalibrate Agency. I'm your host, Danielle Photo. And until next time, cheers. Cheers. <laughs>